You cannot drink from a mirage, but you can drown in one. I am bandy-legged and saddle-sore from riding roughshod over so many conventions. These recurring moments when a great wave of black nausea, dragon's breath, licks across my mind. Women are never stronger than when they arm themselves with their weakness. weakness. Hello, I'm author, musician and journalist Saul Wordsworth. Welcome to this, the third bonus episode of Devil in the Wilderness. Hi, for those awaiting the search for Sprat. That will be the next episode, and likely in the next couple of weeks. I haven't got round to it yet, chiefly because it will take some time. And, well... Time that was the dog at my heels is now the wolf at my throat. Instead, I have new diary material for you. Some fantastic excerpts, including an original poem by my dad, plus a letter that has come to light as a result of this series, describing in amusing detail his wedding to Margaret Ahern, a marriage, you may recall, that lasted less than 24 hours. But first, if I may, Dad? By all means. You may have noticed I keep wanging on about my music, trying to draw you, the listener, to my albums on Spotify and beyond. I was walking the other day with a colleague. He's a musician himself and has listened to the podcast. As we approached the Shell Garage, he turned to me and said, You should release a podcast soundtrack. Excellent idea, I replied. So that's what I've done. Devil in the Wilderness, the original podcast soundtrack is a mixture of diary excerpts and my own music, and is out now. By way of a taster, here's the first track. When I was young, I behaved often outrageously. I cared vitally what people thought, and yet had the confidence to flaunt their criticism. Now I am tamed. I know what people think. The worst. I accept the verdict, except that in my heart of hearts I rebut it with the furious hate that is poisoning me. And here I am, left behind like spoil, or half-finished poems, letters, bad debts on both sides, used contraceptives, library books. These cursed ten years in which an unspecified but golden future smashed suddenly and drove me in on myself. The best all behind me, the worst all before. Devil in the Wilderness, the original podcast soundtrack, is available on Spotify, Amazon Music and all the usual platforms. You'll find links in the description. Excellent. Thanks, Dad. When putting this series together, so much material ended up on the cutting room floor discarded because it didn't quite fit, or another excerpt fitted better, or was too close to something already used. He has some principles, and he clings to them. You can see how white his knuckles. With so much extra material to play with, and the internet boundless, I thought I'd lay some of it out here, for the pleasure of the writing, and in the hope of better understanding my father. I mean, how would you describe yourself, Dad? The mentality of a diseased weasel. The Midas touch in reverse. Cunt-struck and panic-stricken. As inconspicuous as a fire engine in a funeral cortege. Out on a limb and assiduously soaring it off. And like a Bangalore taxi driver, who drives at breakneck speed on the wrong side of the road and cannot imagine an accident until it happens. I am a wreck that has settled on a submerged reef If I am salvaged, I can only be towed a little way in the fairest weather before I founder again. I only asked, Dad. Before the cock grows thrice, you will betray me twice. Bit vulgar. A woman for every day of the year, except leap year. Keep that vacant. No surprises there. 
you will recall that my dad had what in criminal circles might be described as previous. Casting my mind across the women I've had. Three hundred odd. There's plenty of writing about women in the diaries, and not just sex. It's a shame so much of the insight and sensitivity he displays on the page never did make it into the cold light of day. It is amusing that modesty has been made a law for women, who esteem in men nothing so much as their boldness. But here's a little medley. True love is like the appearance of ghosts. Everyone talks of it, but few have ever seen it. The man's desire is for the woman. But the woman's desire is rarely other than for the desire of the man. In their first passions, women love their lovers. And in their others, they love love. Seeing Joan again in a crowded London street. A tiny incident that dwarfs anything that has happened to me for the last ten years. And the dreams of her. So piercing sweet that I could cry. Cry for my moon. As one parades one's indifference to a woman one has failed to possess, and this indifference grows into a strong wish to be away from her company, so with life, if one has failed to enjoy it as one wished, one turns aside from it and gradually becomes pressed with a strong wish to be done with it. The present is a very thin slither pressed between the future and the past, but delectable, like expensive smoked salmon. When it's gone, it's gone. Reformed rake with the urge to stability. So much so that I am magisterial when an acquaintance suggests a louche party. Then staidly possess his wife while his eye is roving. As I was, in a fairly dilettantish way, considering Philomena as a sexual object, I learned that Frank was at Harrow. Thinking he had been at Eastbourne, I might have toyed with the idea. Learning he was at Harrow immediately ruled it out. The chameleon in me. I so long classed people by schools, I was prepared to behave in a third-rate manner with someone whom I believe represented a second-rate milieu. But I became chivalrous and meticulous when it was Harrow. Under examination... Can I ever shake off this feeling that I am confronting invigilators? I doubt it, Dad. What? I said I doubt it, Dad. There's plenty more excerpts where that came from, not least a deep dive into my dad's time with Susan Russell. Sue is a southpaw. Yet, when she breaks a glass in my face, she does it with the right hand. But that can wait until a later episode. I'll finish with the aforementioned poem... Lines of poetry running through my head. Familiar. Rather good. Realise they are my own. But first, the letter cited at the top of the episode. Suddenly I find myself sick of this. Be patient, Dad. You may recall Jeremy Brooks from the series as both husband of the wonderful Eleanor Brooks an author of The Water Carnival, cited in episode two, the novel whose pompous, manipulative central character was based entirely on my father. It turns out that Jeremy wrote a letter to their mutual friend, Cyril Cobbett, in April 1961, depicting my father's shotgun marriage to a local woman, Margaret Hearn, who was carrying his unborn child, a marriage that was dissolved shortly after in fact came to an end at 5am the following morning, my dad staying out all night to deliberately incur a snub and put a premature end to it. All of which was described to me in episode 4 by Francis Ullman, 
still resident in the Kreuzer Valley. Christopher went out to celebrate in the, in the ring, I believe, with some friends and didn't return on his wedding night, this is. Didn't return until three or four o'clock in the morning. And when he returned, eventually got back to Tannabryn, where Margaret was living with her three children and the fourth one on the way. Um, all his stuff was outside. She bagged it up, put it in plastic rubbish sacks and that was him out. I think Margaret, once she'd made up her mind would, about something, wouldn't, wouldn't change it. She was quite a strong-minded lady, and she wouldn't be easily messed around. Anyway, here's the letter. Dear Cyril, the main excitement here has been the Wordsworth wedding which took place at 11am last Wednesday in the Blinau Registry Office. Chris Oliver and I set off from Gethley at 9.30 in Di Jones's Ford, my having borrowed it because the steering on the standard was bad through my hitting a rock with it one night. The steering on the Ford proved to be infinitely worse. The dreadful little motor wandered aimlessly back and forth across the road. It was on our way up to Kreuzer that we collected Christopher, Margaret and the three children at the crossroads as arranged and crammed them all into this terrible little black box together with pushchair and full rucksack. Christopher was wearing a smart borrowed grey suit, new brown shoes, anonymous tie and a belted Burberry which made him look like a seedy commercial traveller Margaret wore a printed cotton frock with a mass of frilly petticoats, chocolate nylons and high-heeled court shoes. We dropped Christopher at John Jones's for the two of them to wet their whistles prior to the vows. I was against this move, having sensed in Christopher all week a certain reluctance to put himself ineluctably under new management. And indeed, we found ourselves waiting an inordinately long time outside the registry office. I was more than half convinced he and John had got no further than the Abbey Arms. I envisaged them embarking upon an interminable discussion of the pros and cons of marriage, literally at the 11th hour, for it was now well past 11am. However, eventually John's van came wobbling down the street, with Christopher hunched disconsolate in the passenger seat, and not, as Ifa had prophesied, enmeshed and chained in the wire cage at the back. We were all ushered into a large room, painted in sick yellow and brown, with faded notices in Welsh stuck on the greasy walls. The only one in English read, in alarming bold, Marriage is a contract entered into for life to the exclusion of all others. The registrar spoke. Christopher William Vaughan Wordsworth, repeat after me. Christopher folded his hands over his groin, stared at the ceiling with an air of imminent martyrdom and repeated the formula in a delicately mocking voice. Margaret was addressed as Miss Ahern throughout and repeated the phrases with a faint giggle. There was some fumbling for the ring and it was over. I kissed the bride and called her Mrs Wordsworth, which made Christopher laugh immoderately. We each sank five Guinnesses at the public bar, but as soon as was decent, piled back into the Ford and proceeded to the ring. Once here, Margaret, in a state of high elation and sipping fruit juice, questioned me about the males of the district who were most likely to make improper advances on her. This arose out of my having asked if she had no vices. She said, Christopher is my vice. And then, after thinking for a moment, she added, well, just men in general, I suppose. Christopher said, according to John, Jeremy is only interested in his friend's wives. Well, said Margaret brightly, I'm the wife of a friend now. Come up and see me sometime. She meant it too. Christopher, I observed, found this remark as unsettling and in the circumstances as ill-timed as I did. 
I returned home for a period, then went back to the party. When I arrived, all was cold and sober. There were many of us, and we sat around the large room, though Margaret had already left. There was virtually no conversation. After an hour, I counted the bottles under my chair, found that I had drunk seven halves of double diamond, and was stone cold sober, so began drinking heavily. The thing never became remotely like a party. No one, except John, got drunk and was seen later driving his Bedford van into walls, exclaiming, I have lost my wife. Gradually, people began to peel off. So by the early hours, there was only myself, Chris Oliver and Christopher. At this point, I suddenly realised that Christopher was hoping to make a night of it. This, for him, was the time to start on the hard liquor and settle down to await breakfast. He even suggested playing poker, a game which he loathes, in order to keep us there, but Oliver and I had had enough. It was 4am and everything had gone cold and sour. A last minute argument about William Wordsworth's place in the hierarchy of poets failed to bring the sad ember to life, and we left. Possibly one for the die-hard Devil in the Wilderness listener, but I hope you enjoyed it. Before we go, here's the twice aforementioned poem by my dad, read as ever by my school friend, actor and voice of my father, the ever-patient and ever-generous Chris Porter. If you want to hear Chris talk as Chris, tune into bonus episode one. In one dull room, two faces meet and smile. Two eyes, two others greet. Lips faintly tell each other fate must give release or suffocate. And in the room, two bodies twine, pig Cupid and his concubine. The form resolved, the form malign. You call me yours, I call you mine. While out of doors the voices say, Time placates, it is nature's way to cheer the progress of decay. You cannot love. Time has begun. The forms divided, one is one. Let time placate the damned, not me, who see within love's lechery, time's only potent enemy, and the hotbed of eternity. And Chris's reading of the poem? I think it's sort of like when he's when he's fucking, he's sort of like, he doesn't worry about shit. I think is the, is the brutal. It's like, you know, I don't want to be placated. You know, like time, time heals all wounds. Fuck that. You know, I don't want to be placated. I, I just want, you know, time doesn't exist. I, I mean, I haven't really picked the bones out of it, but it's essentially about two fingers to fate, two fingers to time. This is about, this is kind of like pig Cupid having his way. Tune in next time as the search for Sprat begins. Devil in the Wilderness is written and produced by me, Saul Wordsworth, Original music from the series, such as this track, is also by me and is available on Spotify and beyond. Links in the show notes. The executive producer of the series is Paul Kobrak. The voice of my father is performed by Chris Porter. The letter featured in this episode was read by Ian Pollock. Thanks for listening.
can see how white his knuckles are. You can see how white his knuckles are. You can see how white his knuckles are. You can see how white his knuckles are.